Last Sunday, we worked with the opening paragraph of Acts chapter 14. And this morning, we're going to read through and consider the balance of the chapter. So if you would, please turn there. Acts chapter 14. We'll begin reading with verse, at verse 8. This is Paul and Barnabas, their first um, missionary journey. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand up on your feet. And he sprung up and began walking. And when the crowds saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us like in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet, he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went with, on with Barnabas to Derbe. And when he had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch. And when they had been commended, where, I'm sorry, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Heavenly Father, now as we come to your word, uh, we certainly are aware that uh, our ability intellectually to grasp and understand and glean from this passage is very limited. And so we ask that by your spirit, you would speak to us through your word. And that we would be able to uh, draw out of this text truths that will feed us, that will challenge and strengthen us and help us to be faithful Christians. And so we commit this time around your word to you. 
and ask you to use it to accomplish your good purpose in our lives and for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Well, after persecution and threats of death uh, that were brought against uh, both Paul and Barnabas, um, they have left Antioch in Pisidia. They had gone on to Iconium, which was uh, east of there, and now they're moving into what is almost exclusively pagan territory into the region of Galatia. But now they travel south. They've been in Iconium. They're threatened there. So now they, they move south, about 16 miles, I believe, and they come to the city of Lystra. What's initially significant here is that their pattern of ministry changes, changes for the first time. They don't go to a Jewish synagogue to begin their gospel work. Now, this is their typical pattern, to come into a city and locate the synagogue. Typically, there would be a community of Jews. Go to the synagogue or go to the church where the people of God gather and um, preach the gospel. Open the scriptures to them. Begin to engage those who were familiar with scripture. Engage them and uh, confront them with the whole issue and question of uh, Christ being Messiah. Well, at Lystra, the pattern changes. This is a, this is a pagan city. And apparently there is, there is no synagogue there. And so, their approach is different. Now, one thing that they did notice as they entered the city, they passed the temple of Zeus. So there is a temple. There is a place of worship. There is a place where the people of this city gather, offer sacrifice. There's, there's, there's a sense, and this is typical of all people, that there is something that is bigger than them, that transcends them, and they, they need to worship. There's a... We are instinctively religious. They pass the temple and they encounter a man who is lame. He'd been there, had been lame from birth. This man has never walked. Now, what shapes this encounter with this particular man is the, the preaching of Paul. Notice in verse 9, this lame man, the lame man who has been sitting at the temple, he listens intently. He listened to Paul speaking, is what Luke says. No doubt Paul was preaching the gospel. And he's preaching the gospel in the shadow of the pagan temple. As the crippled man listens to the gospel, God, God gave him faith to be healed or to be saved. Paul told him to get to his feet, which he did. And he began to walk. Let me ask you, does this story seem familiar? It's very similar to the story of Peter and John encountering a lame man at the gate of the temple in Jerusalem. And they told the man, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk, and he did. I think there's a crucial truth being strengthened here. The same power of God to heal and save that was demonstrated by Peter and John in the shadow of the Jewish temple is now displayed by Paul and Barnabas in the shadow of a pagan temple. The same gospel was being preached. The same grace was given so that this man responded. 
He responded in faith. God used his word. God used this gospel message to birth faith and belief in this man to be made well. Not just physically, but to be uh, made well in soul. God was at work. You see, it's the same gospel. It's the same grace that's at work in Jerusalem and now is being displayed in Lystra. One is a a, a community that has the revelation of God entrusted to them. The other is a pagan place filled with spiritual darkness. But the gospel breaks through Jew and Gentile. You see, that's the point, isn't it? The gospel is sufficient to save both Jews and Gentiles. Well, this is, this is Paul's first encounter with an exclusively Gentile or pagan audience. And what do these people do? What do they do in response to the miracle they witness? Well, they misinterpret its meaning. Now, look at verse 11 again. They lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And they attempt to worship. They attempt to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas, believing that they, they, uh, they were the incarnations of Zeus and Hermes, uh, Zeus being the chief god in the Greek pantheon, and Hermes being his primary spokesman. And when Paul and Barnabas, uh, when they realized what was happening, they, um, they would have no part of it. Apparently, you know, Paul and Barnabas, they don't speak Lyconian. They speak Greek. They could communicate, but these folks, they started talking on Lyconian. They, they didn't get it. But once they saw what was going on, there's protest. They pushed back very, very hard. In fact, they tore the clothes. And this was a Jewish gesture. It's a response to to blasphemy, and they they pleaded with the people not to worship them. Now notice notice how Paul engages them. Verse 15. Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, He allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet, He did not leave Himself without witness, for He did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Paul immediately redirects their attention away from them. He says to them, listen, you need to understand, you've you've misunderstood. You've you've, uh, drawn wrong conclusions from what you've witnessed. We are men of like nature with you. We're just like you. And he turns their attention to the gospel says, we bring you good news. We bring you a gospel. We bring you a good and saving announcement. This is what you need to pay attention to. And he appeals to them. He appeals to them to repent. To turn from these vain things to a, to a living God. They're pagan ideas. They're pagan worship were empty. Uh, it was unprofitable. It was misdirected. They were, they were 
simply the creations of human pride and corrupt imaginations. Notice, notice that when confronted with what they thought was deity, their first impulse was to do something. To do something that would appeal to the deity's favor. So they attempt to offer sacrifices. That, that is a, a very native, very basic kind of instinct when people sense that they're in the presence of deity. I need to do something. You know, this stands in, in stark contrast to the gospel. The, the gospel doesn't call for sacrifice because the sacrifice has already been made by Christ at Calvary. But rather, the gospel calls us to repentance and to surrender our lives to Christ, to confess that Jesus is Lord. It's a very different kind of message. So there we have contrasted, bumped up against each other. Pagan understandings, pagan responses, and the gospel, the light of this good news that Christ has come, He's died, He's taken the punishment for our sin, He's been raised from the dead. And forgiveness, salvation, deliverance from a condition, a condition of sin is provided in Him. Another thing worth noting is that because his audience is pagan Gentiles, Paul doesn't engage them by appealing to the witness of Scripture. These people are, are biblically ignorant. Uh, Scripture is completely foreign to them. And uh, they would never have understood. So the whole pattern changes. Not only do they not go to a synagogue simply because it's not there, but they change their approach. And rather than um, uh, referring to Scripture, which they would normally do with a Jewish audience, they don't. But rather, uh, Paul understands that these people are, are not without a witness. This living God that Paul's calling them to turn to is the Creator. He's the Creator of heaven, the Creator of earth. He's the Creator of the sea and all that is in them. And so, Paul's sermon text is the witness of nature and providence. This living God, this God as opposed to the dead gods of the Greek and Roman pantheons. This God not only created all things, He also sustains and rules over all things. He gives men rain and fruitful seasons. He cares for them. He provides for them. Even when they know nothing of Him. And this is the God they need to worship. This is the God we need to worship. This witness of nature seems so clear to us who believe in the gospel. But the natural mind of man distorts this, this general witness, this general revelation given to us in creation. The natural mind just twists it and forms wrong conclusions. The witness of nature is clear, telling us that there exists a creator, a transcendent designer, one whose mind and power is beyond our comprehension. And yet, because we're corrupt, because we're rebellious by nature, we dismiss this witness. And we just go our own way. 
This became part of Paul's understanding of the human condition. Remember what he wrote to the Romans? Romans chapter 1, verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So the witness to God's existence is, is embedded in the creation itself. So they are without excuse. At no point, at no time, can anyone who has ever lived legitimately claim that I didn't know that there was a God. The witness is there constantly. So they were, they were without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is still the condition of man when confronted with the witness of nature every day we turn away. Listen, we live among pagans, perhaps more sophisticated than those in Lystra, but pagans nonetheless. We're more like Athens than we are like Lystra. Intellectual, sophisticated, thoughtful. Never would consider ourselves to be pagan, but the Athenians were pagans much more intellectually informed than the people at Lystra. But both were pagans. Every one of us in this room, prior to becoming uh, true Christians, decided Christians, we were pagans. Lost. Let me ask, uh, is this you? Is this where you live? Confronted with the witness of nature and conscience every day? And yet unwilling to acknowledge that God is there and that He should be served? I appeal to you to think about it more to think about it more carefully. Another question. What does our wrong-headed response to the general revelation of creation tell us about ourselves? It tells us that we're spiritually dead. It tells us that we're naturally perverse in our worship. We have a native instinct to worship. We're all worshipers, but without gospel revelation and commitment to Christ, we'll always worship the wrong thing will worship the created things rather than the Creator. This serves, I think, as a reminder to us that God may, may use the general revelation of nature to contribute to our conversion, but it's not saving in and of itself. We need to hear and believe the Gospel. You see, you, you may believe in a supreme being, but if you reject Christ as Savior and Lord, you'll still be lost. The Gospel is the power of God for salvation. Paul says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts, if you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Salvation is grounded in the saving work of Jesus.
is found nowhere else. Christ is Savior. We need to come to Him. And as Christians, we need to continue to just trust Him. To hold tightly to Him. Well, not only does Paul have an encounter with pagan Gentiles, he also has an encounter with unbelieving Jews in Lystra. They've come to Lystra. Verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Paul's life had been threatened uh, in Iconium. He had fled the city, but now his persecutors have come. They followed him, and they carry out their threat. An incited crowd, a mob, surrounded Paul. They picked up stones. They, they struck him down. This kind of execution is quite unfamiliar. It's foreign to us, but there's nothing quite as horrific as stoning. tended to be a slow and and, um, excruciatingly painful process. Stones thrown from a short distance. Stones striking the body, the arms, the head, the face. Until the victim fell unconscious or dead. This mob wanted Paul dead. They're convinced now that that has been accomplished, and so they drag him out of the city, and they just leave him there. You know, I'm sure this experience hadn't come as a surprise to Paul. Just remember, remember what Paul, what the Lord said to Ananias uh, when he was sent to pray for Paul, Paul, Saul of Tarsus at the time, went to Damascus. Saul is blinded. He's had this confrontation with Christ on the road. And so God spoke to Ananias and told him, I want you to go and I want you to pray. I want you to pray for Saul. This is what the Lord told him. He said, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Sort of a, there's some irony, there's, there's something here that's quite interesting in that Saul, Paul, the persecutor, has now become the persecuted. The Lord says to him, "Uh, you're going to suffer for me. But you're going to preach and you're going to preach to all people. I'm going to use you to take the gospel to the Gentiles, to the people in Lystra. I'm going to use you to stand before kings and bear witness to the grace and the goodness of God in the face of Jesus Christ you're going to suffer. This certainly proved to be true. Here, here's Paul's recounting of his ministry. at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 23. Uh, Paul writes, With labors, imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one, Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. That was Lystra. It's out of his personal experiences that Paul could say with confidence and conviction, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. What's encouraging 
is that suffering and glory are connected. Paul writes in Romans 8, that we're fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that, that's the purpose clause, in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Suffering and glory. Now, in this experience of suffering, this stoning, what appeared to be death, this suffering... The result of it was not that Paul was glorified. That's going to come later. It's going to come at the resurrection. However, he did experience something glorious. Most scholars believe that what Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 12 was his own experience resulting from his stoning at Lystra. Listen to it. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. I know a man, a man in Christ, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Later in the chapter, he talks about, he says, uh, God has given me a thorn to keep me from becoming prideful because of the tremendous revelations and visions that I've been given. Suffering and glory. God... God does work everything for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Well, as glorious as this experience was, I I think Paul's response to this stoning was equally impressive. Read verses 20 through 23 again. But when the disciples gathered about Him, He rose up. Something happened there, uh, we're not told, we're not, this is not to suggest that Paul was actually dead and raised from the dead. They gathered around him. No doubt they had a prayer meeting. And he got up. What does Paul do? He rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went with, on with Barnabas to Derby. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, With prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Paul doesn't fold. He doesn't lower his public profile. He re-entered Lystra. He went on then to Derby. It's quite quite a journey, actually. Went to Derby. He preached the gospel there. Now, this is a man who's bearing the scars. He later says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He's beaten and he's broken. There's nothing impressive about the physical appearance of of Paul. Naturally, uh, what tradition says, he, he naturally isn't that handsome. He's short. He's uh, bull-legged, somewhat hunchbacked from beatings, probably. Um, it, it, the one description says that he had a unibrow. He had one brow. People didn't rally around him because they thought, boy, this is the handsomest guy. He, you know, he would, never, he would never make it as a mega pastor today, church pastor. 
And yet they said in this one description, sometimes he appeared like an angel and he preached the gospel. But here he is. He is making his way to Derby, no doubt limping. He's bearing the pain of this severe beating. And they preached the gospel there. And then they revisit. They revisit each city that they preached in. And they go there in order to teach and strengthen the new converts. Paul had a great concern for these new converts and these local churches. He knew, he knew that the spiritual health of these new converts and the sustainability of the Christian witness in these communities was dependent on strong, well-ordered churches. So what, is, what does he do? He returns, and he returns at great personal risk goes to each of these cities and he appoints or he, he ordains, sets apart elders, pastors in every church. Paul understood the importance of the local church in the individual Christian's life. And as a result, he, he says that he has um, carried a great anxiety for all of the churches. He was always concerned, always praying for the churches that he had planted. That they'd stay vibrant and healthy and strong. Carried that burden. His conviction was vibrant, preaching, disciple-making churches. The Christian witness would be distorted. It would lose its persuasive voice. It would become ineffective. For Paul, the proper ordered, properly ordered church involved a right understanding of the faith. Definite article, the faith, a body of teaching. In other words, a church that had a confessional standard that conformed to the apostolic teaching. It was comprised, it was uh, led by mature and well-respected office bearers. There were elders and deacons in each of these churches. And it was also made up of a body of committed, mutually edifying members who served and, and cared for one another. In this kind of healthy church environment, the gospel would be preached without compromise. The sacraments would be administered faithfully, and the members would be disciplined and discipled. It's within the life of the local church that Christians grow best. This was Paul's conviction. Establishing the church, ordering the church, praying for the church, loving the church. And it was expected, it was just expected that every Christian would become not just an, not just an uh, attendee, but a member of the local church. Because it's within the context of the church community that we're encouraged to break free from our self-centered, me-oriented patterns. Patterns of life that really, really shape secular society. And we come into this community of believers and we serve Christ together and we encourage each other and we support, and we serve one another. We're committed to each other. When the membership of the local church is healthy, when the membership is committed to one another in very self-conscious ways, when we're lovingly serving one another, then the fellowship we share becomes a foretaste of the age to come. 
this is why this is why we're moving toward establishing church membership here at Cornerstone. We come from a tradition that's fairly new that had uh, pretty much a disregard for any kind of formalized commitments within the local church. But we've decided that in order to order the church properly, there needs to be a very clear and a very self-conscious kind of commitment made to one another as members of the covenant community to become members of the church. I should, I should save this illustration for a later sermon, but it I just hit me again. Um, do you think that you could go down to the local Moose Lodge and just hang out there for a year? And if someone asks you if you're a member, you say, yeah, I'm a member. They would say, no, when did you become a member? You've just been hanging out here. You see, there's something about that public, intentional, saying, I am part I want to be part. I want to come under the care of this group of people. This is something that was part of ordering the early church. Listen, there's absolutely absolutely no downside to church membership. So in the near future... um, I'm going to be preaching a sermon series on church and church membership. We'll conduct our initial series of membership classes. And we'll probably celebrate our first uh, membership Sunday before summer. You know what would thrill me? Is we'd just have every one of us that are here this morning. We just all have to stand up. And uh, I'm becoming a member. I've been here. I love these people. I'm going to declare it in a very open way. I'm going to come under the care of the church. That's what, that's what Paul was doing as he ordered the church, went back, set an order, gave them elders, gathered the church. Well, let me just finish. Um, there, are, there are some very important lessons to be learned from the early history of the church that's recorded for us here in the book of Acts. We learn that the gospel's powerful to save, to save the worst of sinners. We learn that the gospel's to be preached to all people everywhere. And we learn that when believed, the gospel gives birth to the church, covenant community that's countercultural that's Christ-honoring and mutually beneficial to its members. Remember, this is what Jesus came to do. He came to build His church, a spiritual fellowship and an earthly institution. And these are, these are not at cross-purposes to one another. In fact, the spiritual fellowship The invisible church is embodied in the visible church as an earthly institution. I don't know how many are here this morning. We can all become members of this church based on very fundamental, basic criteria. Do you know something? Not every one of us in this room is a member of that spiritual fellowship, probably. Haven't yet come to Christ, but boy, when you live within this environment, God help us as leaders. Where the gospel's proclaimed and preached and you listen, you sit under the voice of the gospel week after week. The Lord can work in your life and bring you to faith. This is where it ordinarily takes place, is right here in these settings.
some glorious truths that Paul has displayed just in his personal experiences. And uh, I pray that God will help us. Help us to grow in faith. Help us to love Christ more. Help us to love each other more fully. And uh, just to be open to move forward in him. To grow in grace. Let's pray. Father, today we've looked at this text. And uh, there are truths that surface here that are very important for us to understand and to embrace. We're so grateful for the grace of God. So grateful, Lord, that you are able to save the worst of us. We're thankful for the call of the gospel. We're thankful, Lord, for your people, for the church. So help us to grow, to grow in our understanding grow in love for you and commitment to to each other as well. So minister to us, I pray, as we close our time now around your table, acknowledging that all of this, all that defines us as your people, flows from this source, saving work of Jesus at Calvary. So we commit these moments to you now as we close our time of worship in Jesus' name. Amen.